Philadelphia, Union, San Jose, or DC, Los Angeles, Galaxy, Beach Pass. Colorado Rapids, Vancouver Whitecaps, Seattle Sounders, Montreal Impact, Tosh USA, York Red Bulls. Pitch Pass, your all access credential to the people that matter in MLS. Here's your host, Greg Roach. Well, we are back, and thank you very much for downloading the latest episode of Pitch Pass. <laughs> Big day. We're recording this on a Thursday in MLS history, some would say. We'll talk about the new logo in depth with CSN Houston and NBCSN's Sebastian Salazar a little bit later on. But first, I want to thank you for supporting the show, and supporting just means something as small as downloading the episode or maybe telling a couple of friends about PitchPass.com, our home base on the internet for the show. Now, let's talk to the guy who is experiencing one of the biggest breakouts of the 2014 MLS season. He is now the all-time leading goal scorer for homegrown players. It's Los Angeles Galaxy's Jossie Zardes. He joins us right now on the show. Jossie, how are you, sir? I'm pretty good. I'm about to tell. I'm good. I'm good. I uh, I had a little trouble, though, because, you know, as I'm trying to get ready to, to have this conversation with you, I, uh-huh. I, I go on the internet, as you do, to, to look up people. I'm on the East Coast. You're on the West Coast. The problem is, my friend, you have a very low internet profile. I mean, for, for, for even a regular person, let alone a public figure, you're not much about Jossie Zardis on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I just say low-key, I, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it, so it's very, it's very difficult. I don't really know much about you, which is kind of good because uh, this is what the conversation is for. Um, so let's let's just start from the beginning. Um, I, I I guess my big question for you is: uh, you're the first homegrown player that I, I've had a chance to speak with on the show, and I'm just very curious to hear how the the homegrown thing worked for you. So going back to to your first experiences with LA Galaxy, how old were you, and and how did that whole signing with the academy go? Well, I was I was uh, 16. When I uh, first joined the LA Galaxy, so I'm club team, and um, and after that, um, I mean that whole experience is just wonderful. You know, um, we had these elite elite coaches um, coaching us while kids our age on other teams um, didn't have like the the, um, the 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 things we had, such as like the coaching staff, the stadium, um, just the training facility. It was just uh, it was just world class and top notch, and you know, just uh growing through the academy, um, having all those things really helped me be the player I am today. And what kind of player were you when when the Galaxy first kind of saw you and were maybe scouting you? Um, I mean, I was all, I was always fast for my age. Um, I was always fast, you know. Um, uh, I had a skill as well, but um, I would definitely have to say uh, before, uh, I would say Galaxy really, uh, really meant uh, a mental aspect of the game. They really taught me uh, – taught me how to play and um, and think better you know and if, if you're giving away any trade secrets secrets just say hey hey greg i can't i can't get into that but uh, like how do they do they come to like your matches when you're before you sign and and kind of just scout you out were they scouting out another kid and you were there how does how does that work well for me for the sum cup team they they uh i mean you got invited and um i i, I don't recall the amount of players but i mean you had i think over 30 players or uh, even more than that, um, all trying out on the same field, and you wore a bib with with a number on it. And all we did was just play games. I think it was for three days straight, just uh, just playing multiple games. And then if if they called your number and you got a call back, they wanted you to come back to another training session and then get get paid for the team. A little nerve wracking. I mean, I, I would imagine as a 16 year old to 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 be in that situation. Um, how did you hear about the trials? Is it just something where? Just people in the soccer industry or in the in the LA scene, where it's just like, oh, hey, Galaxy tryouts coming soon. Are you going out? Am I going out? How's that working? Yeah, for me, well, my 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 club coach uh, for South Bay Sports, Paul Crumpy, he uh, he let me know that Galaxy was holding a, a tryout, and I went out and tried out. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, here you are. <laughs> But oh, yeah. it, but it actually it wasn't like that. Um, you actually went to school, which a lot of the academy players do. Uh, did you have the option to to sign a pro contract uh, before you went to college, or was it a situation where you knew you need a little more seasoning in the college game? No, I mean um, I, I I always wanted to sign pro professionally uh, after high school, but um, I mean um, they they felt otherwise and felt like I had to mature, so. 
I went the college route. And I guess that's the first time where you say to yourself, all right, well, I can either put my head down and and mope, or I can go to college and do what I need to do to get that pro contract, which I'm looking for. Exactly. And I just kept my head high and just knew I, if I worked extremely hard throughout college, um, I'll receive a call back. And so uh, now we're at the point where, where if you just search Jossie's name on the internet, you, you figure out you can fill in some of the blanks. But I will ask you, what happened between your freshman year and your sophomore year that really uh, made you start to blossom? Um, I would definitely have to say just uh, just uh, the hard work I put in, you know, and just uh, really listening to the veterans on the team. Um, because last year, you know, I was a rookie in the league and uh, coming into this new environment, this new atmosphere, and um, just really trying to adjust to the game. But I feel like over that that one year time span, I've learned so much from the veterans, such as Landon Donovan, Robbie Keane, Omar. You have Janino, Marcelo. Like all these guys have played professional soccer um, for at least you know three or four years, you know, and um, and they're just very insightful and just really really passed down helpful tips and advice and what I've done is just really kept my ear open. Um, I talk less and just really try to take in what what they're trying to, to teach me and, and and show me, you know, because they've been in all kinds of situations professionally and uh, they see the potential I have. So what I really try to do is just listen to these guys. And that that totally is coming out on the field as this is kind of your breakout season. But I was actually specifically asking you about your your fr- between your freshman year and sophomore year at Cal State Bakersfield, um, oh. where, where you had that kind of goal explosion. Oh, in Bakersfield, well, it was it was the same ordeal in Bakersfield. I mean, I had a, a wonderful coach, uh, Simon Tobin and uh, Keith Costigan. But I remember my first year, I think I scored five goals, and then um, they really worked. They really work with me, and um, Bakersfield is the type of place where you can really concentrate and don't have a lot of distractions. And I really put my head down and listened to them and, and worked extremely hard. And sure enough, once that next season came around, I mean, as you've seen, um, the goal difference, uh, everything that, that I worked for before the season really paid off once the season came along. You know, we talk about in in the American game uh, whether going you're going to go the homegrown route or you're going to go to college. You're actually a perfect marriage of the two, where you got some some academy schooling, uh, then you went to college, got the playing time, got the seasoning you needed, and then graduated from from the the college game into the pro game. Is yeah. is, is that the route? Is that that route worked for you? Obviously. What is your feeling on on things that you can learn in the college game that you may not be able to learn either playing in the academy or even say playing for LA Galaxy two? Well, I mean, um, I feel like uh, you mature as an individual when you go the college route. You know, you're uh, you're away from family, you're living on your own, and um, things off the field play a huge factor on what you do on the field. You know. And um, just uh, having the right mindset and, and just uh, just knowing how to basically take care of your body off the field as well. Um, I felt like going that college route um, will be something different than playing the academy ball. And also, I, w- I would definitely have to say a huge thing I've learned. When you go from the high school level to the college level, you're playing against men, you know. You're coming from yeah. playing against guys that are smaller than you to playing against guys who are, who are much stronger than you, much faster than you, much bigger than you. Um, which forces you to play faster, quicker, and think think even faster, you know. And when you when you switch levels and go from college to professional, it's the same ordeal once again, you know. It's just uh, you you're playing with grown men, guys who are strong, you know, fast, and and can really think on their feet. So it's all about that adjusting and really trying to uh, take a year under your belt and just try to go go with the flow and just try to make a huge impact. You know, and you brought up something that I had never thought about, but is totally true, and that is uh, going away to college. Whereas, if you had gone through the academy, signed as a homegrown player, you you're, you're still living in that kind of bubble of of where you lived and where you grow up. You drive home every day. Going away to college is is an education unto itself, where you're learning how to live on your own and take care of yourself, which you may not get if you go right from the academy into the first team. Yeah, ex- exactly, and and that's what I meant by what I said. You know, uh, just going away. You learn so much about yourself and just how to take care of yourself and and just just your mindset. You know, you just got to learn how to be comfortable 
in an uncomfortable situation, you know? Yep. And I, you you mentioned Landon and Robbie, guys who are mentoring you. We'll, we'll talk about them in a second. But I actually want to ask you uh, if you are starting to pass along some of your knowledge. And I'm thinking specifically uh, of Bradford, who has graduated from the academy and is now in the first team. For you, for him, you're a guy who he's probably looking up to. What are you doing for him? Are you taking him under your wing to show him, hey, this is what, I know what you're going through because I came through the academy as well, and now I'm in the first team. Well, every time, yeah, every time I talk to uh, to BJ, um, that's what we call him, BJ. Uh, <laughs> every time I talk to BJ, you know, I'm always giving him um, live words of encouragement. You know, he's 17, he's pretty young, but he's uh, he's very skillful, you know. And I just I just always ask him certain questions, just. Uh, just about how's everything going, like on and off the field, and um, how's his game coming along, how he's feeling. You know, I don't try to be on top of him like a like a dad would a son. You know, I just try to just uh, talk to him and just see how he's feeling. You know, see what he's going through, and if I hear something like that I've been through, I'll just uh, give my two cents. You know, I don't want to impose on the, on the personal boundaries, but I just like to uh, just uh, listen to what he has to say, and uh, and if I can give my input. Um, or any helpful tips or advice, I'll do the same. He has been tweeting out his uh, his FIFA profile a lot the last few days. <laughs> I have to ask you: Are are you happy with with how your FIFA uh, player has turned out? How is jo- Jossie Zardis for FIFA for Jossie Zardis? Well, I, I saw. Uh, I think I was a seventy. You know, uh, <laughs> it'd be nice to be better than a seventy. And. Uh, and I think on the on the physicality side, uh, I should be more than than what it what it what it displays. But I mean, um, the I like I love FIFA, you know. And what I like about FIFA is, if you're on form in real life, when you get an update on FIFA, the video game, yes, they'll update it, you know, and yes. you'll grow. So if I'm growing, if I'm growing as a player and individual in real life. The game will update itself, and hopefully that 70 will turn into like an 81 or something one day, you know. How awesome is it not to have to create yourself in the game oh it's amazing you know growing up <laughs> growing up as a kid that's the first thing i used to do when i bought fifa i used to create myself exactly and then you'll have them you'll have them play for your club you know and um and to be a pro mode but um I mean, it's amazing just to, to have myself on a game already so I don't have to go through that hassle. Exactly. Hey, well, or if I, yeah, and if I go to a friend house, I can use myself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the best part is you don't have to go through the, uh, because this was always the pain for me creating myself. You got to go through and you got to pick their physical characteristics and you got to hope that it gets close to you. You don't have to do any of that anymore. Yeah, I don't have to do any of that. It was like a dream come true. <laughs> and they got the blonde mohawk, right? Yeah, well, on the last one, the whole head was blonde. So oh. I, I, I'm waiting for the new FIFA, <laughs> waiting for it to drop next week, and going to see how they, how they have me on that game. All right, so uh, you're the first person I'm talking to in the league that since the logo has dropped. So what are your thoughts on the new MLS logo and, and specifically how it fits into the galaxy and the galaxy variation of the logo? Um, I, I like it, you know, um, it's something new and something different. I mean, I'm so, I'm so used to the old logo. Yeah. But, um, I like how this, uh, I like how this new, new logo symbolize America. You know, you have the red, white, and blue, you know, you have the, the three stars and also, um, you know the country colors were very important. I mean, we have a lot of guys that that um, we have a lot of guys and a lot of teams that are from different countries, um, such as like uh, Canada. I mean, it's not far away, but you have a lot of guys playing in this league, and you know it's a American-based league. So I feel like uh, this new logo um, is going to be the new beginning to to something that means more. You know, I'm hoping that someone will Photoshop the blonde mohawk into the white part and just take, take a little bit of literary, get a little creative, and put the blonde mohawk in to the, to the white side of the new logo. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> so we mentioned Robbie and, and Landon earlier. Um, you mentioned how, how much they have had an influence on you, especially this season as you are uh, experiencing your breakouts professionally. Who is the uh, the hardest on you, Landon or Robbie? Because you know I've read some interviews where Robbie says he's not afraid to 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 tell you if you're doing something wrong, and I imagine Landon's kind of the same way. Yeah, I mean both of them are the same. They're they're both not afraid to tell me if I'm doing something wrong. You know, um, 
both of them get on me, you know, and I, I love that. And both of them give me wise words, wise words of wisdom. So, I mean, I can't choose one or the other because both of them play a huge role in, uh, in my, my soccer career, you know. So uh, I'll definitely say, I have to say both of them are, are, are not afraid to get on my case if, if something's not going right. If I, if I need to make a play and I don't, they both speak up right away, you know. What was what's clicked for the club in the last, let's say, two and a half months? You guys, I don't want to say stumbled out of the blo- of the blocks, but you didn't get off to the start that I would assume you guys wanted to. And I feel like now, uh, the last two months, you guys have been clicking on all cylinders and kind of giving the league a glimpse of what's to come, especially as we get to closer to the MLS Cup playoffs. What what's kind of changed from the beginning of the season, first half of the season, to now? I feel like the, the the mentality, you know, we have a we have a new mentality, and um, we work for each other. Our team chemistry is phenomenal, and uh, we're always there to back each other up. And um, and like I said, like the mentality is the key because, like you said, the first uh, the opening season, the opening games of the season, we didn't do as well. But now, um, the the second half of the season, we had a, we just have a new mentality and just we really oppose a threat to other teams, and our work rate is phenomenal. Before I let you go, I gotta I gotta ask you as a as a new father, how uh, how are you doing with the sleep? How are you staying well rested with a uh, four month old? Four month old, yes. Um, you know, uh, my wife is doing an amazing job, and also uh, my son he sleeps all throughout the night. Now, no, Jossie, don't lie. There, <laughs> four month olds do not sleep through the night. <laughs> Hey, you you will be surprised. You'll be surprised. I tell everybody the same thing, and they're just like, you have a good knock on wood. Seriously. Yeah, but I really have a good. I mean, he sleeps throughout the whole night. I never, never really complain about anything, to be honest. How long has he been sleeping through the night? Um, I want to say once he hit, like, the three-month mark. Okay, all right. Yeah. At first, like at first, it was like every two hours, every three hours, wake him up. But then now, I mean, he'll wake up when he's hungry. Like we don't really have to wake him up now, so he sleeps all the way throughout the night. You've got a hardworking mentality, uh, as evidenced by your ascension through the academy, through college, and now into the pros. Um, so you know, I'm not going to say that that you know, as a young guy, you have you have an opportunity to be a knucklehead. But 23 year olds newly turned 23-year-olds, but 23-year-olds uh, can be a bit of a knucklehead if they want to be. Not you, you know, now newly married, uh, have a have a newborn son. How much has that kind of focused you even more on making sure that you've got everything in line professionally to do what you need to do? Um, it help, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it, it helps me focus even more, you know. Um, it helps me mature even faster as well, but it really helps me become organized, you know, and not have distractions. Like I'll say, um, for example, a 20, another 23-year-old um, that's playing professional soccer or whatnot could be doing everything he wants and and, yep. and and going out, hanging with multiple friends, you know, because he don't have obligations yep. and, and, and stuff. But uh, that's distractions, and uh, I feel like that will that will be a bad thing, Um I have a bad presence within his game, but as for me, you know, I'm, I'm organized and I, I really have a, a strong foundation set up, you know. Um, I have my family, um, and I I don't have those other distractions that other 23-year-olds would have, you know. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm really focused and I have my mind set on the goals I want to achieve, you know. Um, I have I have my son looking up to me, you know, so I... I mean that's 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 a huge thing. So I I just want to make sure all my actions I do I think about him and his future. So well put, very well put, Jossie. Thank you so much for hanging with us. Um, we're hoping for, and I know you are as well, a January call up, and uh, that will be nice to see you in a U.S. Men's National Team camp. And you keep doing what you're doing. I'm sure it's going to happen. So thank you, my friend. I appreciate the time. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it myself. Good guy. Good head on his shoulders. Looking for some big things from him in the future, not just for the Galaxy, but also for the men's national team. Jossie Zardis joins us uh, as we continue with our good friend from Comcast Sports now, Houston. He uh, actually will be in Salt Lake City. Uh, maybe he's even calling us from Salt Lake City. We'll have to ask him. Sebastian Salazar joins us right now. Sebi, hello, sir. I'm well. I'm well. I am. Uh, I'm traveling the uh, the great American nation. I'm in Salt Lake today. Okay, City. that's we were going to ask where where you were. I thought you were in Salt Lake City. 
Yeah, Salt Lake for Salt Lake, Colorado, then a quick trip to uh, to your old neck of the woods, Philly, for, uh, for Houston and the Union. Do we need to talk a lot about Houston? Um, I think for the next week or so, maybe until after this Union game, they're, you know, they're still a threat. I think if they don't get three in Philadelphia, which actually you know, people say the Dino really struggle on the road, and statistically that's very true. PPL Park is one of the few places they've actually enjoyed some success. Um, and, and they've gotten a few results. Uh, the, the, the game against Columbus was a massive disappointment. And um, and if you don't come back and get three on the road to kind of make up for the two that you lost at home, then, yeah, I, I think that the ask is too much in, in what will be their last six games uh, to climb not necessarily the points, but to climb all the teams that they'll have to kind of overtake to get into the playoffs. So, uh, you know, I think there's still another week or two where, you know they're they are relevant despite results, but after that, if it's if it's not three and three over the next couple games, it's, it's going to be very difficult for them to make the playoffs. And I don't even know if we can go by the hey they usually can go into PPL and get a result. The, the more I see this team, you know, and we're always loath to count out the Dynamo, but the more I see this team, the more this team doesn't feel like your quintessential Dynamo team. Well, they're not. I mean, the, the defensive record says that in and of itself. I mean, uh, you know, Callie Hall get, gets hurt and uh, Tyler Derrick comes in. Now, Callie, I think by his own admission, did not have the 2014 that he had in 2013 where he was awesome. Um, but, you know, the, the center of the defense has been an issue. I think the first time we talked this year, it was a question mark. Yep. The second time we did the show, I, I probably called it issue. And I think now you can say that it, it may be the issue that when it's all said and done, keeps them out of the playoffs. It's really hard and maybe harsh to focus on one spot in the team, but, um, you know, it, it was a spot even like dating back to last year um, had some question marks. And then you let Bobby Boswell go. You see what DC United's back line, how, how, how it's improved with him in the mix there. Um, Jermaine Taylor is, is now out with a concussion issue. So, so that's been an issue. And I don't think his play has maybe been, what it was in the past. And then you've got a couple guys who were um, gambled. And, and that's who right now is, is, is manning the back line. It's David Horst, who's coming off an injury and, you know, at some point had pretty high hopes and pretty high potential, but, but nobody would really seen him put it together for a whole year. And we're finding out now that that, that, that transition is, is not necessarily um, the easiest. And then A.J. Cochran's a rookie. And A.J. Cochran has a lot of upside, but he's a rookie and he's playing a, a position where and Bobby Boswell and I used to always talk about this. You know, we, we have a tendency to throw out center backs when they're 28 because we say they're old. Yeah. When really, that's the, the golden years of a center back. Completely. He's a guy who's a little bit longer in the tooth, but a little bit sharper up top and, and a little bit more savvy. And um, to ask a, a, a rookie to come into MLS and, and kind of shore up your defense late in the playoff run, it's a, it's a big ask. And, and I think the Dynamo are kind of learning that lesson the hard way here. You know, and I don't even know what it is. I, I've, obviously, I'm a Bobby Boswell apologist, but I just, I don't, I don't understand. Look, look, it's just, it's a good head on your shoulders. It's knowing how to play the game. I, I would actually argue that Tally Hall in 2014 has been similar to Tally Hall in 2013. But you're seeing now with DC United, where as Bill Hamid will stand on his head three or four times in a match, that's different than standing on your head ten times a match. And I think what Boswell brings is Tally Hall only has to make two amazing saves a match instead of five. And then when you don't have those 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 three three amazing saves leeway, you're going to get three goals. And I think with DC United, it's the same way. Whereas stuff happens in front of Hamid that will shield him, but then when things do break down, he can go then and stand on his head. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I just know having watched, I don't think the Dynamo make the playoff last year, and I, I, I don't think that the Dynamo center back situation of 2013 was overwhelmingly better than what they've gotten in 2014. I think it was better, but I think the biggest difference was when those, when those breakdowns occurred last year, Galley Hall made the saves. And this year, maybe that, that great save eluded him or didn't come as, as often. He pulled out, he made losses, ties, and he made ties wins last year. And that hasn't happened for the Dynamo. And I'm, that's probably not on tally, right? That's one guy out of 10. You, you have to put the, some of that responsibility 
on the field players in front of him. But, um, you know, for me, the, the, the defense of the Dynamo was, was not great last year, but Tally was, so the numbers weren't as, uh, as, as kind of shocking as they are this year. I mean, you just you – don't, you don't put Dynamo and worst defense in the league in terms of goals. I'm no. not saying defense meaning the back four. Defense is an 11-guy proposition. But the worst defensive team in MLS and Dynamo, they don't, they've never gone in the same sense. I don't want to talk about the, the burial of the Dynamo for 2014 until it's officially over. But – and I know we're going to talk at some point in the offseason – it doesn't look like this is a quick fix team either, unless you're going to count on the younger guys maturing. You're not going to have Hall for the beginning of the season, you would imagine. Um, you've signed some some players who are under some big contracts. This isn't a situation where you blow out the team, rebuild a la DC United, and, and go back in with a new squad next year. I don't know where this team is going to be able to really make market or drastic improvements going into next season. Yeah, there will be some. There will this year. They were very limited in terms of cap space. They had some guys on contracts. I'm thinking Jermaine Taylor, Omar Cummings, um, guys who frankly haven't lived up to their you know their pay scale uh, so far in 2014. Um, and I think that those guys will either be moved on or renegotiated at, at a cheaper rate based on what we saw, and that'll open up some things. But you're right. Uh, as I look at the roster, um, you know, you're, you're basically going to have to hope that, that a, guys like DeMarcus Beasley, Brad Davis, um, Boniek Garcia yeah. are, are going to maintain their level, if not improve. Um, I think Will Bruin's a guy that, that you can count on for, you know, 10 to 15 goals in MLS season. He's also going to miss his fair share of chances. We'll get a lot of criticism for that. But I think if you look at his record as far as goal scoring for American forwards through the first you know, few years of a career, it's right up there at the top, if not the best we've ever had. Um, so, but, yes, I mean, I, their depth is a major issue. This team has no depth. And that's when you start talking about roster rebuilds and, and kind of um, you know, moving on from, from the the Dynamo team that we've seen that made the 2011, 2012, and even 2013 runs. Um, yeah, that, that, that team is the core of that team is getting older, probably on the back end of some primes and the depth just hasn't been there. Um, you know, when they dipped down this year, it was because all those guys were gone and, you know, the depth and center of defense um, guys like Andrew driver were leaned on Omar Cummings was leaned on. Uh, David Horst was certainly leaned on. This was before they got Luis Garrido. You're talking about Warren Craval. And those guys were all, you know, okay, but collectively they, they weren't good enough to get wins and points and even at, at stretches score goals in MLS. Um, so, but there, there are some players here that are, that are exciting. I mean, Luis Garrido to me is a guy who you can expect to, I think, have an even bigger impact next year. He's a good guy. Giles Barnes is playing yeah. incredible right now. There's, there's some talent here. There are players, there are six or seven guys. But the reality of a 34-game MLS season is you probably need 14 to 15, and I don't know that one off season is enough to fix it. Maybe if you said two was enough to fix it and you counted last season, but I don't know that the moves they made last off season panned out the way they thought were going to be. So you may be actually starting kind of from square one as you had after 2013. Let's talk about the other team that I'm sure you're following closely. You know, everybody knows I'm a DC United fan, but I try to go out of my way to not go overboard or over the top with DC United stuff. But when I talk to somebody who also knows DC United, I, I get excited. Uh, for everything that went wrong last year, everything seems to be breaking right for United this year. And I'll even go uh, one step further. It feels like even the injuries are breaking right for United in the sense of you look at uh, a Spindola going out, Eddie Johnson coming back in. Uh, Eddie Johnson get a concussion just as, as a spindola is, is healthy and coming back in. Chris Rolfe breaks his arm, which is, which is horrible. Uh, oh, Chris Pontius is, is ready to start getting first-team minutes again. It, it feels like even the, the, the possible what's, gonna, what's Olsen going to do with his club once everybody's healthy questions, the injury seems to be solving those questions, which are putting those questions down the road, which makes me more excited because you think to yourself, a healthy Rolfe going into the, into the playoffs, a healthy Pontius back up to full fitness 
surrounded by healthy players, it's just exciting all around to be a United fan. No, you're, you're not wrong. And, and even the Rolf injury, like you said, as, as kind of terrible as it was, hey, you know, he's, he's going to be back for the playoffs at a time when you kind of assume they you know, they haven't clinched a playoff spot, but mathematically, they, you know, they're, they're pretty darn close. You, you know they're probably going to make it. Um, and, and the severity of the injury is such that, that he'll be back for the games that, that really count. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they, and you know what to me the, the kind of shock has been is, um, and this may be something that other teams look at when you talk about kind of one year rebuild. Um, usually when you one year rebuild, you, you don't do it to a point where you have depth. Um, and their depth is really is incredible, especially up top. Um, you know, there are other, some other places outside back to me is, is a big worry. Um, but, but just in terms of the positive, you know, to have so many options um, and, and, and so many different options, guys that, that both in their own games do it differently but also have kind of different high-end qualities, um, it is really exciting. Uh, the, the midfield has, has kind of the, the bite that maybe it seemed to lack a year ago. There's an accountability, kind of those cliches. Yeah. The, the, you know, all the stuff that, that you can't quantify seems to be there. Um, and I, I think, you know, and, and this is something that you'll know well, having been in D.C., I know well, there are a few GMs in Major League Soccer who have been as maligned as Dave Casper. And I, I wonder now if people are saying the same things, because if, if this finishes out as it started, and I don't know that that means an MLS Cup, maybe it means a trip to the conference finals, and, you know, maybe it means a, a conference regular season, um, you know, top seed. Uh, it has to go down as one of the best single season makeovers of a team by a front office ever. Agreed. And 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 there's you know two guys you point to there, Dave Casper and Ben Olsen. And and I you know for for all of the flack that that Casper's gotten, look, I used to work with the guy, so take what I say with a grain of salt. But I, I think that you you have to point the finger at him now, just as as people have in the past. So let's look at some other teams, and we'll uh, we'll move over to Los Angeles. We just had Jossie's artists on, real good guy. Make sure you listen to that, Sebi. I know you uh, haven't heard it yet. Um, you look at the Galaxy right now, coming off of the run of form that they're having, but then you look at a team like Seattle, just high flying. First of all, I can't wait to see those two teams go at it. Which team would you give the edge right now? I have to give it. To LA because um, I just find them to be more complete, and I don't know if that's because I assume they're more complete because Bruce Arena coaches them and they have some names in the midfield that I, I, I've come I've just kind of come to expect a certain amount from. Um, the high end in Seattle is incredible, and you can see when and like the Open Cup to me with. When they go up against a team like Philadelphia, yeah. with all due respect to Philadelphia, and Philly had, you know, a stretch there in the second half where they could have found a second, and they they could have kind of grabbed that game, but you know, having Obafemi Martins and Clint, it's almost not fair. It is fair, but it's almost <laughs> not fair um, what they do with those two guys, and, and and when those two guys are really clicking and playing off each other, it's. It's next level stuff. It's stuff that we haven't seen a lot in MLS, other than maybe Landon Donovan and Robbie Keane. Um, so, you know, I, I give the edge to LA. I also think LA has a, a little bit of kind of Landon impetus behind them that I think will matter. Um, I think I think that will make a difference. Uh, so I give the edge to Los Angeles. But if they were in opposite conferences, I would pick them to meet in the final without batting an eyelash i mean i think to me they are clearly the, the two best teams in the league and it's I, I don't even know i don't even know that there's a third best team that's in that conversation if that makes sense yeah i mean i was going to ask you about the city that you're in but they're they're lacking something i don't know what it is that that keeps them from they're a very good team but just not on the level of those other two teams well i mean to, to be fair uh Goals cost money, and um, RSL does an exceptional job, but they don't spend the money in the way that a Seattle does or that a L.A. does, especially for those up-front attacking players. I mean, the salaries that Landon, that Donovan, Keane, 
Dempsey and Martin's command is not in the RSL playbook. What they've done despite that or in spite of that is, is remarkable. And, and I don't know, if you're not, if you're another team in MLS that's not kind of that high end, big money spending team and you're not doing what RSL is doing or trying to copy it, I think they're doing it wrong. Um, but, but I think that the, the top end for them, you know, Alvaro Sabrio is, is a great MLS forward. And yet, He's not in the. He's not at the level of an Obafemi Martins or a Clint Dempsey or or a Robbie Keane. You know, he he's not there. Um, and but he's their guy. And so I think that's the difference between the two teams for me. I I, I love RSL midfield. I love what that group does. Um, their depth at the back. Uh, when you've got a kid who's playing, you know, may end up being a starter or a big part of the Mexican Olympic team. Um, that that's your kind of third option. When Nat, you know, Nat Borchers is out this week with a red card, and you can slip a kid like that in. I mean, that, that's pretty serious depth there. Um, I, I think their team is exceptionally well built. But again, at that high end, and, and sometimes soccer comes down to high end guys making individual plays, especially in the in the tight road games, playoff games, games where there's a lot of tension. Um, stars often make the difference, and and RSL doesn't have that. And, and it's all like the team is the star. So I. I don't put them in that category. Um, that's not to say that I don't really respect what they do and, and don't think that on their day they can get a result or two in the playoffs against an L.A. or a Seattle. I just think you have to, you have to if you're Vegas, you, gotta put, you have to make your favorites the favorites, and that to me is L.A. Can you, can you bet on MLS matches in Vegas? Um, I can't. <laughs> I don't think. Um, I don't know if I need, can, I need to know I'll if we can this may be a this may be a, 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 a taboo subject, but the day that MLS um, draws gambling interest Agreed. is a very good day for this league. Agreed. A very good day. And and I don't know that we're there. I think one of the big reasons why is because you can't it's impossible to predict MLS. I mean it's impossible to predict the NFL, but look if you look at Vegas lines, not that I do, on a Sunday, um, they're very accurate. They are very accurate. And I don't think I think MLS is so even um, and there's, you know, it's, people know so little about it in Vegas, probably. Yeah. Um, that that I think I think it's right now. It, it, you know, the casinos would say, well, we don't know. We'll probably lose more than we'll make because there are there are people out there who know more. Yeah, that's a definitely an unspoken MLS next level thing. Hey, speaking of uh, hashtags that are sweeping Twitter, MLS yeah. next uh, unveils the logo today. Now, I want to ask you about the logo in just a second, but lost in the logo was the uh, the kind of subtle, hey, Chivas not going to probably not going to play next year. Which, you know, if that happened in any other sports or any other league in the world for soccer, that'd be a huge talking point. Uh, I think MLS has done a good job of kind of burying the fact that one of their teams is established. is just going to hit the pause button for a season or two or more. But uh, is that a big deal uh, in the grand scheme of things? Or is it just part and parcel of having gotten in bed with the Chivas people and now this is the fallout from it? Look, when you say... When you couch it like that, hey, if an established team in any other league shut down for your view of your story, it makes you think, yeah, wow, that is shocking. And yet it also goes to show how irrelevant Chivas yep. USA is, that no one's up in arms about this, that no one is really outside of your MLS writers that cover it and say, hey, uh, this is kind of a weird thing for a league to be doing. Um, fans don't care. Nobody seems to care. Uh, Chivas USA is irrelevant. That brand needed to die. And so if it takes a year off or two years off, um, I don't know that I have a problem with it. I don't know that it bothers me in the least. Uh, It's just one of those things where, you know, this this idea had gone south so far that um, it was time to to make a change. And, And maybe that year or two years off, distancing yourself from what was, He's the best way to go because if if you bring this team in and you get the type of ownership that it seems like MLS is looking for, right, the deep-pocketed ownership that can build a downtown L.A. stadium, uh, they're only going to get one chance to make a first impression in a market that we know from other sports even is extremely fickle. And if you go in there with an expansion team built off the skeleton of, of a terrible Chivas USA over the last two years, you know, you're setting your your – you're setting your timeline back, um, maybe not permanently, but in a very drastic way, I would think. 
I think you got to go into that market and this situation guns a blazing. So I, I think it's a, it's a dramatic decision if they do sit out, but I, I don't have a problem with it. Here's the thing. Because I agree with you 100% in everything you said, and it, you know it's it's quote unquote not a loss for the league because this is what this is the bed that we got into. But here's here's the people that it does matter to. Uh, DC United decides they're building a stadium in Baltimore. They move to Baltimore, or, or or even Sacramento. They just move the team out there because they can't get a stadium. You've got DC United fans who may say to themselves, "I'm going to root for Sacramento because that's my old team." What do you say to the ten to fifteen thousand Chivas USA fans? And you can you can laugh all you want about their attendance figures. They have a fan base. It it may be small. It may not be the size of Seattle Sounders, but there are ten to fifteen thousand people in Los Angeles who do like Chivas USA. And you're basically telling them, hey, just be a timeout person. Root for the lo- the new logo for two years. I just you're alienating those fifteen thousand people that that not only don't have a club in their city, they don't have a club at all. Yeah. No, I, yeah, 15,000 may be a stretch, but... Um, well, I'm not saying yeah, they all go to the yeah, matches, no, no, but... No, whatever they are, they're there, and, and they do matter. You're right. Um, but I, I think it's one of the, the kind of results of a growing league. I mean, what happened to fans of these Philadelphia Athletics or, or you know, the, the Boston Redskins when that was a thing? I mean, you know, that's, this is, a, this is a, a league still in its, as Don Garber said today, growing from adolescence to adulthood. There are going to be changes, and 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 there are going to be you know things that are lost. And and if if five to ten thousand Chivas USA fans are lost to gain hundreds of thousands fans um, in a, in a downtown LA or somewhere else, uh, yeah. sorry man, it's part of the cost of doing business. And I I would hope that those people, um, you know, find find a team to root for or, or or find a way to stay involved in the American version of soccer because they're valuable just like a fan in D.C. or New England or anywhere else. Exactly. I mean, but, look, you, but, look, you're not... But I, I don't think you, you can't make a decision based on 5,000 or 10,000 people. I, I hear you. I hear you. But I... Sending love to the Chivas USA fans because it doesn't feel yeah. like anybody else is. And by the way, this isn't the hipster cool thing to do to like the soccer team because everybody else likes the football team. These these people had a choice. They chose to go with this team. They've stuck with this team through abysmal results and attendance figures and sharing a stadium with a team that hasn't had to do that. And they've stuck with it. And their their thanks is, eh, you know what? Whatever. Find another team to root for for two years. Yeah, no, it's 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 an unfortunate end, but it's the right end, and, and I think the end is the most important thing. This is a league that could no longer have um, that situation in that market, and 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 that's the bottom line. And and whatever the cost is to fix that, both for the league in terms of buying the team back, um, it's very important. So, what do you think of the logo? I don't know that I like it or don't like it. I think it'll just take me a while to get accustomed to it. Um, it feels very hipster, millennial, whatever you want to call it. And I'll tell you, being at the broadcast meetings this year, um, the term millennial got, uh, I'll say promoted, but I mean shoved down our throats. Yes. Um, an incredible amount. And I get it. Hey, that's that's the demographic that likes this league, and, and that's that's who you're, you're catering to. And, and this logo would seem to... Um, maybe from a design standpoint, do that. Though I think that's very subjective. I, I, what do millennials all like, like minimalist <laughs> art? I, I don't know. Um, that's painting with a broad brush. It would seem to me. I, I love the idea, though, of an interactive space within the logo. Um, I think that white space allows people to to make this their own. And I think MLS got that right. Or, or it's an idea that they got right. I don't know that if you do it on your logo, you're inviting some yeah. ugly things probably too. It's very interesting but, you would say that because to me, that t- seems to be the big point of, of derision with the logo is that white space. I, I, go ahead and finish your thought because a, a lot of people, they, that's the part they like the least about it. Well, to me, but to me, it's the, it's the ultimate move to cater to a, a generation of people who know how to do stuff on computers mm-hmm. and people can drop videos in there or, or, you know, make whatever they want of it. It's, it. it's in some way giving ownership of the league directly to the individual fan. Yeah. Um, so and that it, you, and, and, and it, it makes you engage with the logo, which in one way is, is forcing you to engage with the league. I, I, I'm not, you know, I know from a design standpoint, it may not be the prettiest thing, but but from a functionality standpoint, that to me is cool, and, and I, 
I can't imagine that's not why it's there. You know, and that's there. it's a great point because you, you you're talking to the generation that has to have their voice heard. Uh, feels like they, their opinion, their voice is just as important as anybody else. So they've got to post it on Facebook. They've got to put a tweet about right. it. They've got to do it Instagram. And now you've got a logo where, okay, here's a space for you to have your voice be heard. And even if it's negative stuff, like, you know, there's been some goofs already uh, up about the logo. It's still, you're still putting the logo out there, even if you're, exactly. you're tweeting it in a, in a negative light. Yeah. To me, to me, there are some, there are some drawbacks, um, that are things that I thought of. One of the other things that I liked was, you know, kind of the, the, the turn of the generation. I've always said, you know, people want soccer to be, when's it going to overtake basketball? It, it is a generational thing. And I love the fact that the league is addressing this in terms of the turn of a generation. I've always said, my kids will grow up going to MLS games. Yes. Um, I, I didn't go to my first MLS game until 1996. I was already 12. Now, it, I, you know, I may as well have grown up in it, but, but, you know that that gener- that next generation, the generations that are coming, are going to be the ones that push this thing to a place that you and I have dreamt about for a long time. So, so it's important that they know that, um, and and I like that. But the one thing that to me um, was a negative is I don't know that I like a team having two logos. If that makes sense, um, you're, you're in, in one breath. Don Garber saying, you know, our stars are our clubs, and our clubs matter, and and they, the individual clubs matter, and now you're 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 splitting their identity almost in two, and and you're muddying the brand. I don't know that that those two messages are consistent, and I don't I just don't know how that plays out. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to be a failure, or a bust. I just I, why should DC United have two crests? Why should Columbus Crew have two crests instead of the one that they want to have? Um, and the other thing is the the continued push on club and country. Um, you know, the three stars club country community club and country was great in 2014, but that's because there was a world cup. And I don't know that that same refrain carries as much weight moving forward again until 2018. I don't think 2016 will be different. I think it'll be the first non world cup where people, because of Copa America coming here, that where people are following the U S team in a, in a non world cup yes. way. I think that'll be big, but to, to me, that those two things, um, maybe leaning on the club and country and, and the splitting of the logo were the big questions of the day for me. Yeah, but and, you, I, and I know everybody has different questions, but those were my two kind of like, what? It's a fair point. And, and, you know, maybe five minutes ago before you, you laid your millennial, this white space is yours theory on me, which I now love and embrace, uh, I would agree with you. However... To me, I look at that as the you're blending that logo, which you just said is should be flexible enough to be used in in any circumstance. You're blending it back into the club, and you know even going further inside the DC United crest or logo is their logo. That's their badge. But you know what? Here's my secret probation card, my double secret probation. I'm going to throw out the MLS DC United version. That just lets you know that I'm I'm actually even further. I'm in the VIP curtain or the 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 uh, the velvet rope area of fandom and that just lets you know that I'm not just a guy on board for the for the general purposes. I also know the inside stuff as well. And here's how you know. Well, yeah, and you know what else it, it does and something you and I I think have talked about quite a bit off the record is and this is something everybody who knows MLS and loves MLS and covers it knows. Uh, we have we have too many fans of the team. Yes. Or we have fans of the teams, and not enough of those care about the rest of the league. The, the 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 entirety of the you know having all of those teams now fit into a logo that all the other teams have makes you in some way, and I don't know how, but it makes you more aware of the league. The league. The league, not DC United and going yep. to a game and having a good time or sporting park and going to a game and having a good time. But, oh, this, this other team in the league that I like or don't like or, or hate or, or love. Yes. Um, so it, it somehow raises the awareness of the entire product as opposed to simply the, the local product. And, and that may be worth the muddying of the water in, ha- in terms of having two crests. The other thing is the community, which I think, geez, what, a, what better week to come out and say, hey, we're a yes. bunch of good guys and we love community than this week. And Garber kind of subtly took a shot at the NFL at the beginning of that press conference. Don't think he didn't. Um, when he when he locks in on community and what that means to this league and and the charitable efforts of his players, 
Um, it's a very good time to be good guys. And MLS right now, Fair Runter has a good guy reputation. And to put that in the crest in that third star, I think, um, is, is, is smart. And now it looks like genius. It's a fraternity for me, um, being in a DC United fan, but then being a fan of MLS, it's a fraternity. And now this is another way for me. If, if I go to, if I travel to, to Houston and see the dynamo and, I have I don't wear the, the the DC United badge, but I have the the MLS logo with the DC United colors. It, it's a kind of a secret handshake now, where I say I say, look, I could wear my letters, my fraternity letters, but we're gonna do the double secret probation fraternity handshake now, and I'm gonna let you know I'm a fan of MLS and I'm I'm rocking DC United. So a, a, a Dynamo fan will look at me and go, uh, okay, I see where he's coming from on that. Yeah, no, there, there's a little bit more. Um kind of connection in between uh, the fans. And you're right. And if that's true for soccer fans in this country. Yes. If you say you like soccer in America, you've got a bond with whoever else, else it is you're talking to. Yep. Even though by now we're not that much of a minority. Um, but especially if you say MLS, you, you really have a, a quick kind of instant bond. And this this crest um, may be a part of that. My only other thing on, on, on the, the logo and the announcement would be this. At some point... And, and maybe we're not there yet, and I don't know the answer. Don Garber and his people, um, the people that drive the game in this country, know it better than I do it. Um, we need to get away from the kind of standing on a podium and making bold proclamations yes. because um, to the cynic sports fan, and, and, and not, not that we need to cater to them, but, but to the people – who maybe don't follow soccer, they're not going to necessarily see this and be like, oh, MLS is advancing. They'll see it and say, oh, it's the soccer guys again, you know, banging the drum yeah. for, for something. What, a new logo? Trying to re- Why are we having a multi-million dollar announcement and release and press conference? What, what's all this about? Yes. It's there's, a- oh, there's no actual news? Um, okay, cool soccer. Like, keep being weird in the corner. Yeah, I think... I, don't, I never pander to those people, but I do think at some point we need to move past that Hey, we're here. We've arrived. Yes. It's next. Um, it's, yeah, it's cool. We're here. Got it. Done. Like, let's not bring it up anymore. Because every time we do, we almost validate um, all the all the people who are still hanging on to what I think is an antiquated notion that soccer is. Completely agree. And it, it goes even further. We can stop putting the versions that we're on. Like, we we get it with 2.0. Yes, 3.0 is coming. That's fine. Be the league. Put a good product on the field, and and let's right. go from there. We don't need to have a, uh, like you said, a press conference or an announcement every few months to say, hey, now we're doing this as well. Right. Now, if you couple this with the announcement, like at last year's All Star Game, of four new expansion teams and the goal to get twenty four by twenty, you know, then then you've got like a substantive announcement. But but to do this on its own and then do another, you know, and yeah. it just. It feels like we have a lot of watershed moments, and the definition of a watershed moment to me is that it doesn't come around all that often. Yeah, agreed. And you know, and I will say, my my thoughts on the logo when I first saw it was it's fine. I mean, it didn't engender any hatred in me or any no. any any feelings of love. Um, and also, get past what the the brand is supposed to mean and and all of the corporate speak of of what the slash means and all that other stuff. Is it a logo that's 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 fine? And it is fine. And as a first impression, I think fine is really good. And I don't think any other logos throughout the country and a, throughout the sporting community in, in the United States are anything that blow you away. It's just what they stand for has become iconic. And if the league becomes iconic, then the logo will become iconic. Um, I also, just on a, on a more casual note, I don't know why they didn't explain what the... Uh, the little kickstand was for they they broke down everything in the logo except for the kickstand yeah and you know it's funny that's the first thing that everybody points out yes and everyone's like hey i could do without that if, if they just took that out i'd be okay with it um but you know what it's something different it's something that people who don't care anything about mls or soccer will say hey what's that about well and uh, let me can i can i throw can i throw something out yeah that line doesn't hold to conventional thinking. It breaks through barriers and what you think you know and goes into were, an area. Were you in on the meeting? Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like that may be what they're going to tell us. In the no, you know, maybe it was a mistake by the artist and they just fell in love with it. You know, sometimes that's, that's uh, 
one of those things. I, I don't know. I don't really like I like you said, it's one of those things where even that unique and kind of quirky thing about the logo, uh, hey, it is different. It's different yep. from every other league logo. It, it it doesn't have a border or a traditional border. Yep. And um, you know, is that is does, is that gonna define what MLS is in twenty years? No. It absolutely is not. It matters not at all. But Hey, it's different. People will talk about it now, and if the league does what we've discussed, which is what both the NBA and NFL and NHL to a certain extent have done, which is create brands that then the shield means something because of the game, um, then it'll be really cool, and 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 that you know that extra line will be beloved. That's the bottom line. I love the extra bottom line. I love your white space theory, and it's something that I'm going to grab a hold on with both hands and run with. In fact, you know, we talked to J- uh, Jossie's artist, and I even said to him, "I go, oh, it'll be cool if somebody puts the uh, the blonde mohawk in the white space." So s- subconsciously, I was already on board with you, but you just articulated in such a way that now I love it. Yeah, I mean, I I think, and and look, it's again, it's a thing that no one else is doing. Um, and it is very much a call to the people who you have, maybe rightly or wrongly, and I don't know if it's right or wrong, but you have really thrown your cards, you, you've thrown your chips in a pot with the millennials. They've done that. Um, and, and right or wrong, at least they are, they have an idea, they're going with it, and, and they're doing that idea right. Um, and, and that's, I think, all you can ask of a league office is to, is to have a vision and follow it through. Is it the perfect vision? Is it the right vision? We don't know. I don't know. I can't see the future. But they, they know that the stats tell them millennials care about this league. And they said, and overwhelmingly so. And they said, well, if that's the case, then we're going to make our decisions based on those people. And this logo absolutely caters to that with the white space. I'm sure we'll talk to you as the playoffs come around, so uh, I won't bid you adieu for the season. But this is it for our conversation. So, Sebastian Salazar, we'll look forward to seeing you on television, NBCSN. When's the, what time's the, the match tomorrow or Friday? It's really late East Coast. I don't know. I think it's an 8 o'clock start here, so it's at 10 where you guys are. But, yeah. yeah, and it's part of a, let me do my pitch here, part of the triple header this weekend. Portland, Vancouver on NBCSN, and then... Uh, Seattle and New York on NBCSN. So three games in one weekend on the, on the mothership. For a huge loser like myself, those late night Friday games are awesome because I'm not out anyway because I'm a loser, but it also feels like I have something to do and now I have a reason to tell my friends, nah, I can't hang out. I gotta uh, stay home and watch some matches. There's some MLS on. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, I look, and it's one of the things we talk about even with the new TV deal, right? You gotta have those games that kind of stand alone. Exactly. And appointment viewing. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that RSL Colorado is overwhelming appointment viewing. But um, you know, I remember doing a game here last year that was RSL Portland. It was appointment viewing. It was, a, it was a great game in a Western Conference, and it was on a Friday night. And, um, you know, yeah, it, it, it gives people a reason to watch at a time where uh, there's a little more in the, in the yes. sports television universe. So it, 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 it is a good fit on Friday night. Sebby, thanks, man. We'll catch up with you later on. Will do. Thanks for having me. show information, go to pitchpass.com.